Welcome to Celebrating Act Two. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life. Hi, this is Art Kirsch with John Coleman and our always special guest, Manny Pacheco. Hi, guys. Hey, Manny, good to see you again. Well, it's good to be here. <laughs> uh, I was talking uh, about uh, women's roles with somebody, w r women's roles in television and film, and um, how they've changed over the years. And I mean, I don't just mean from the 60s to the new millennium. I mean, from, let's say, the silent era to uh, to the 40s. Mm -hmm. And, and th that somewhere in there was women's roles just were totally different and uh of course today women in film and other organizations have been lobbying for more roles better written for women more women's films kind of thing um which i think is always an issue but back in the in the 30s 20s 30s boy there were women i just think of some of the actresses back then who who were major forces in the industry their roles were different. They they played different characters. Much they were at one time they were body, were they not? Yes. B a w d y body. Yes, yes. body. Yes. Yes. What happened, Manny? What happened to women? Well, there's a wonderful documentary that was done by Turner Classic Movies called "Complicated Women," and basically it told the story of how women evolved during what we called the pre-code era of Hollywood. Now, if you've never heard of the pre-code, you're in for a real treat. This is something that's enjoying a new renaissance on programming from Turner Classics and, of course, Hollywood historians who have always loved the pre-code era. It was the era of film between silence and when uh, the Hayes Code came around, which was roughly between 1927-ish, although really the pre-code era came into full fruition around 1930. And it, it's extended into 1934. And yes, John, the uh, women that were involved were really uh, movers and shakers of the business. And you have to start with the woman who was married to the all-important Irving Thalberg at MGM, and that's Norma Shearer. Here was an ingenue of the silent era who turned her career completely around, making herself a modern woman. And a modern woman included having um, relations with men out of wedlock, maybe in some cases uh, bearing a child, uh, emerging uh, in any way, shape, or form to, uh, to succeed in business, and they would use any and all of their feminine wiles. Norma Sher led the charge, but there were others. Uh, Mae West obviously came from Broadway to bring her brand of comedy, which was very adult very sexual, shall we say. Also, Joan Blondell was over at Warner Brothers doing her thing and uh, often barely dressed. And of course, um, the career of the fabulous Barbara Stanwyck was born out of the pre-code era. And here's a woman who really never lost the instincts of pre-code throughout her entire career. So Barbara yes. Stanwyck would have to fall into that. And then there were also elements of showing um, that women could actually be interested in other women. That's a pre-code concept. And of course, the forerunner for that, the actresses who really led the charge, Marlena Dietrich and Greta Garbo. But you yeah. keep referring to pre-code. What is this? Well, the, the Hayes Code came out in the 1930s. It was an informal name for the motion picture production code, which was adopted in 1930. It was a set of rules that governed American filmmaking and shaped, in many ways, American cinema for over three decades once it emerged in 1934. It also happened to completely overlap the entire golden age of Hollywood. When pre-code ended, the golden age ended, and the independent film emerged, the modern realist uh, uh, genre of films emerged, and that was around 1967. And what pre-codes did was stifle not only what women could do, but really what a lot of uh, directors and filmmakers, I would say that the, the Hayes Code, led by uh, Joseph Breen, who was really working in tandem with the Catholic Church, uh, they were uh, set on changing the way um, 
audiences looked at sex and the way audience uh, audiences looked at violence. If we can if we can digress from women for a second, there were many films that were very very influential in the way they were made pre-code. After the code, they they might not have been able to be made. In the horror genre, there was Frankenstein, Dracula, The Invisible Man, and The Bride of Frankenstein with its uh, with what we called uh, gay elements. Then there was obviously the gangster films, Public Enemy and uh, Little Little uh, Caesar. Uh, I was a fugitive for the Chain Gang, Scarface. These films were less impactful after uh, these kinds of films were less impactful after pre-code. But the women's pictures really emerged during pre-code. And when the when Joseph Breen actually put his teeth into how films were made. Uh, women lost that independent streak of, of being uh, bosses at companies and being in charge in their own relationships. And uh, all of a sudden, they, there would have to be some sort of a retribution or uh, a, a come to Jesus moment for these women at the end of the pictures that were not believable and stifled the creativity of the women involved. So it's no... It's no secret that the number one filmmaker of 1934 pre-code was Mae West. Once the code was enforced, the number one filmmaker was a different kind of woman, Shirley Temple. Wow. <laughs> so there you go. So, so but getting back to so getting back to the, the code, Hayes Code, um, uh, was this a an attempt at self-regulation by the the industry, did they decide to do it on their own, or what pressures were there, assuming there were pressures there, to create a code in the first place? Because the movies were doing pretty well, were they? Yes, and, 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 and the short answer to your question, Art, is yes, it, it was a way to keep the government out. However, Joseph Breen secretly was working in tandem with the, with the Catholic Church. And um, he whatever the church edicts came down, he, he went for and he applied it into the code. And in many cases, before the code was adopted, you would find uh, uh, priests and parishioners in front of movies that they deemed um, not family entertainment. And they would actually shame people for going into the movies. And it had a tremendous effect on people uh, who were very devout. And so sometimes films that could have been big hits have actually failed. Now, it was hard to, to, to say that, let's say, King Kong or Frankenstein would be unacceptable to, to, the, to the Catholic Church. But in one instance, uh, the movie Tarzan and His Mate, there is a scene uh, where they're both swimming. And it is quite clear that Maureen uh, Sullivan uh, is, is nude. She's naked. And they filmed it that way. And that was um, not acceptable to the Catholic Church, not acceptable to Joseph Breen. And that one film probably did more to bring on the Hayes Code than just about any other film. Wow. Well, that's a shame. But it has it gotten better? Now, here we are 50 years or 75 years later. Um, has it changed? When did it change back, if it changed back, and how, how right. much of the influence lingers? Well, today? far be it far be it for me to say something is better than not, because the movies of the 40s, 50s, and 60s were quite good for many reasons. Uh, this, despite the Hayes Code, and, and there's one film, I think I've mentioned this before, that really was in battle with the Hayes Code that I, I can't believe was made during the uh, during the golden era, and that was Psycho. But that said, to answer your question directly, it all changed in 1967 when the um, when the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences decided that they were going to change the way we monitored the viewing of films for families and, and taking it out of the motion picture industry and putting it in the homes where it belonged. And so what happened is in 1967, they created the ratings code, G, P, G, uh, uh, R and X. Those were the initial the initial codes, and they allowed families to make the decision whether or not they should bring their children to to movies. And the uh, the directors and producers of movies automatically overnight changed the content of movie making. It was so quick 
that in 1966, the best picture of the year was this regal, historical, biblical story, uh, A Man for All Seasons. Fabulous film, by the way, with Paul Schofield, but it was rated clearly a G film. It's, it's, a, it's a religious epic. The following year, movies like The Graduate, Bonnie and Clyde with its bloody uh, finale, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, the, the concept of, of mixed marriage, and the Academy Award winning film that year was In the Heat of the Night. And one thing you will notice, what emerged automatically in 1967 was the independent woman once again. So you would have Anne Bancroft as the philandering uh, wife with the young student, uh, Dustin Hoffman in The Graduate. Bonnie was clearly an independent gangster in Bonnie and Clyde. And, um, and of course, guess who's coming to dinner where you have the daughter clearly making her own decisions on who she should marry. And I don't know why anybody wouldn't consider marrying the very handsome Sidney Poitier if you were a, a young available woman of 1967. So everything automatically changed to the way it was, well, almost the way it was during the pre-code era. Sure. Great perspective. I, I love uh, I love the way you put it into perspective for us. Well, and uh, pleasure, yeah. And of course, every era, every generation has to make their own decisions. I, you're looking back on the Hayes Code. It's, I guess, in a way, it's comparative to prohibition. Yes. Uh, I I know my parents talked about prohibition. They were kids, but they talked about it as a, a really bad idea. You know, that got put over on on the American public. Right. Well, it, 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 it fostered uh, the, 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 the uh, black market of selling of, of bootleg sure. liquor, which, which really helped the gangs. The gangs loved prohibition, but that wasn't the case with these films uh, of the 1940s. They were very homogenized, and they have to have predictable endings. And uh, some of the rules of the Hays Code that, that went into effect immediately, if you committed a crime, you had to pay for that crime, either by going to jail or ending up, uh, if you committed murder, you would have to pay with your life. Uh, you, uh, you could not uh, commit any kind of adulterous act without having to uh, pay retribution. Uh, there had to be some sort of a redemptive ending of sorts where uh, if there was a man and woman involved, that the wholesome, if not unbelievable, ending would emerge, uh, which would be to great disappointment of, of many of the actresses of the day. And of course, profanity uh, had to be approved as, as it was uh, for, for Clark Gable to utter, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Now, Remember that uh, the British imports were not subject to the Hays Code because they were in another country. So you could actually hear a bit of profanity used in British films. And a great example of that was in the film Pygmalion, which, of course, is the non-musical version of My Fair Lady. And there is a scene where Leslie Howard in 1936 says, damn, 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 as, he, as Rex Harrison did in, in the film. 1964. So that predates actually uh, uh, Clark Gable's uh, uh, pronouncement at the end of Gone with the Wind. Interesting. I remember uh, when Gone with the. I remember early the controversy of Clark Gable saying, "Damn, I don't give a damn." Yeah, oh, it was a oh, big controversy. Oh my goodness! Well, wow, scandalous. Yeah. <laughs> And of course, uh, now uh, there there isn't a movie that doesn't have some sort of uh, some sort of profa profane pro proclamation at one point or another. But, uh, uh, short of short of Disney movies, obviously. Yeah. But, I, I was explaining I think, to. Uh, what sorry, I was just going to say is that I think women still have a long way to go. The battle remains, uh, especially if, if women who turn forty, they're always constantly fighting for for I mean for roles that automatically go to Meryl Streep perhaps Glenn Close or Francis McDormand. But, you know, um, there just, there's just got to be some sort of um, sensitivity from the writing core to create films for the modern woman. And that's always, that's always a, an obstacle. It's always a challenge. It's always a challenge. Yeah. Uh, Manny, love, love your perspective on films. Thank you for uh, explaining the Hayes Code a really important era in filmmaking that a lot of people don't know about. 
Well, the pre-code era is just never discussed, so I'm always happy to, to bring it up. Well, my suggestion is that if uh, people want to learn more about pre and post, they go to www. Forgotten how. And with that, I, I, I think it's appropriate for me to darn at the end of another episode of Life with Manny Pacheco. It's too late. I've been profane. <laughs> <laughs> See you guys. Take care. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage. Follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life.